Good evening, everyone. Erev Tov. I'm Rabbi Rachel Martyr, and uh, I'm, I have the privilege of serving at Congregation Bethel. And we're so thrilled to be here tonight for the Rabbi Yechiel Orenstein Sukhranoli Vracha Memorial Lecture, um, and to, to welcome Dr. Robert Alter as our scholar uh, this evening. We're so, so looking forward to learning with you tonight, um, and so privileged. It's fitting that Rabbi Orenstein, who was the rabbi of Bethel for 35 years, and I absolutely love hearing stories um, about him from our members, that he was a teacher at heart, um, that he had a way of connecting with students, young and old of all ages, and helping them into text um, and fall in love with Judaism and feel a part of our community and of this people. And so it's fitting that each year when we honor our beloved rabbi's memory, it's through study, it's through learning and growing together. And uh, I'd like to invite Sylvia Ornstein um, to introduce our speaker tonight. Dear friends, it's my honor and joy to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Professor Robert Alter. I'm so grateful to Professor Ornstein, Professor Alter for agreeing to speak at this lecture in memory of Yechiel. Yechiel and I first met Professor Alter long ago, first at Ramah, and then later in New York at Columbia and the Jewish Theological Seminary, when Professor Alter was Uri and Yechio was Jerry. Not only did we know him to be a great scholar even then, we also counted him as a dear friend, and I am privileged to continue to do so. Were I to list all of Professor Alter's achievements and awards, this introduction would probably take longer than the lecture itself. So I'll mention just a few, but you should multiply the list exponentially. Professor Alter has taught Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley since 1967. His doctorate is from Harvard and he has honorary doctorates from among other places, Yale, Northwestern and the Hebrew University. He was a Guggenheim Fellow twice and has been recognized for lifetime achievement from as diverse institutions as the American Council for Learned Societies, the Los Angeles Times, and the Conference on Christianity and Literature. The subject of this evening's lecture is what may be Professor Alter's crowning achievement, the translation and commentary on the entire Hebrew Bible from the first word of Genesis to the last word in Chronicles. Before Professor Alter gives us his insights into this magnificent endeavor, I thought you might be interested to learn something of the extraordinary range of his knowledge, interests, and expertise. Just as examples, his dissertation included expositions of the works of, of Thomas Mann and Saul Bellow. He published a book titled Necessary Angels, which explored the association of three modern masters, Franz Kafka, Walter Benjamin, and Gershon Scholem. And he published volumes on Stendhal and Vladimir Nabokov, with whom I was privileged to study when I was a student at Cornell. At last count, Professor Alter has written 28 books in all, books which have been translated into 10 languages. Professor Alter calls himself a celebratory critic and said he has written about works of literature because he loves them. That love shines through his translation of the Bible. The roots of this enterprise can be traced to Professor Alter's teenage years in Albany, New York. He went to what he calls a typical Hebrew school at a conservative synagogue. After his bar mitzvah, he said he was ready to ditch the Hebrew language entirely, but two conservative synagogues in the area got together to offer an advanced class. He had attended and was so intrigued that he decided he would achieve a complete mastery of the language. So he took a Hebrew dictionary and resolved to commit it to memory. It took a while. As he said, it turns out there are a lot of words that begin with Allah. It may have taken a while, but there are very few to equal Professor Alter's command of Hebrew. In 1982, he wrote The Art of Biblical Narrative, which was hailed by critics and colleagues 
alike as a revolutionary gem. It has been in continuous print for the last 40 years. About that time, Professor Alter also began the monumental work that is the subject of tonight's lecture. Working alone, writing by hand on narrow lined paper with a cross mechanical pencil, Professor Alter provided over 3,000 pages of translation and commentary. It has rightly been called a work of genius. Professor Alter's translation uncovers the poetic beauty of the biblical narrative, and his commentary reveals the countless complexities and subtleties in the text. As the author Cynthia Ozick noted, you think you know these texts, or you do until you read Alter who reignites their beauty, embracing in unexpected ways. I proudly display the three volume box set of Professor Alter's work on the coffee table in my living room, and I consulted for each week's Parsha. This past Thursday, cousins from Israel, Anne and Hananel Mirsky visited me. Hananel, like his father, is a linguistic scholar the author of a book called Torah HaLashon Shal Menachem Ben Surak, The Linguistic Theory of a 10th Century Spanish Jewish Philologist. As we were talking, Hananel picked up the first volume of the box set and opened it to the first words of Genesis, which are usually translated when God created the heavens and the earth. When he read Professor Alter's translation, when God began to create heaven and earth, Hananel cried out aloud in delight. He has it right. No one else has it right. Hananel kept reading. And when Anne told them, told him that they had to leave for the next visit, Hananel only agreed to go if I promised to send him a box set of his own. <laughs> it's on his way to delight and enlighten yet another enthusiastic and grateful reader, Professor Alter. Before we, before we turn it over to uh, Dr. Alter, just a brief uh, word of housekeeping. You'll notice that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom box. Feel free if you have questions for Dr. Alter, can write them uh, using the Q&A button throughout uh, his teaching this evening. And then when he's done, we'll open it up and uh, ask him some of those questions. And hopefully he'll have some of those answers for your questions. Okay, first, I, I would like to say how gratified I am by... Uh, Sylvia's uh, introduction and I'm impressed by the thoroughness of biographical research she did on me. Uh, you know, as she said, she and then Jerry and I were, were friends going way back to our now very distant youth. Now, the obvious question anyone would ask about someone who, who translates the, the whole Hebrew Bible is, why would you do this? I mean, a, after all, the, there's a canonical translation, the King James Version. The, there are, are probably hundreds of different English versions of, of the English Bible. And uh, I started work on this in the 90s out of a nagging sense that there was something wrong with all the, the existing translations. Now, part of what was wrong, or a large part of what was wrong, is that they, they totally ignored or ran roughshod over or distorted the literary beauty uh, of the Hebrew prose uh, and the Hebrew poetry. And I suppose that that's what many readers associate with, with my translation. But I would like to say at the outset that I'm also absolutely committed to accuracy. And I find that the existing translations are often quite inaccurate. And I'm going to just give a few examples. Now, uh, you're probably aware that in the second half of the 20th century, the major denominations all sponsored new, presumably up-to-date translations of, of the Bible. The, the one that I'm sure is familiar with my audience is the New Jewish Publication Society translation, which began to appear 
in individual volumes in the 1960s. Now, when I first began work on biblical uh, narrative, uh, I had a lot of respect for that translation because I figured, well, the, these people are eminent Bible scholars. Uh, a couple of them were my good friends, uh, uh, the late Moshe Greenberg and, and the late Jonas Greenfield. And if this is the way they translated the Bible, that's obviously the authoritative way to do it. And um, so my own ad hoc translations for analysis in the art of biblical narrative were more or less, I blush to say, patterned on the JPS translation. I came to regret that. <laughs> and when uh, I uh, did a revised version of the art of biblical narrative, uh, I think around 2011, uh, I was scandalized by, by the badness of those translations, which followed the JPS, and uh, I um, uh, did them all from scratch. So let me begin with, 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 uh, with accuracy. Uh, I find it a little bit shocking that these learned committees of Bible scholars with degrees for the JPS from the University of Pennsylvania and um, uh, uh, Chicago and uh, Yale and Harvard um, made some really bad mistakes. I'll give you one example. In uh, Exodus 19, be, before, uh, as God is introducing the awesome Sinai epiphany, he says in this translation, and as far as I know, in all existing translations, uh, uh, behold, I am about to uh, reveal myself in a thick cloud. Now the Hebrew expression is av he'anan, but av doesn't mean thick. Uh, th there's a related word, ave, which has three consonants and a different root, ayin, bet, he, that, uh, that means thick. But av only means one thing in, in the Bible. It must occur about 15 times, cloud. So you have, I'm about to reveal myself or to appear in the cloud of the cloud, or, or to, to make it a little more like the, the Hebrew, in the, the thunderhead of the cloud. Now, what's going on there? Uh, this is a, another feature of biblical usage that, as far as I can tell, has not been noticed by the scholars. There's a form in biblical Hebrew called the construct state, or in Hebrew, smichut, which is when you put two nouns together with um, nothing in between them. And it, those two nouns mean the X of Y. For example, to say the house of David in Hebrew, you say Beit David, with, with Beit being uh, uh, a, a slightly shortened vocalization because of, of the combined form of bayit, a Hebrew word that most of you probably know. Um, but what happens when two synonyms are combined, such as the, the, the thunderhead of the cloud? This always means an intensification, a heightening, a superlative of the, the, uh, the meaning of each of the words. So what we have is not a thick cloud, but something like a, a super cloud, the cloud of all clouds, a mythological cloud, uh, which is rather different from a thick cloud. So I translated it as, uh, I am about to appear before you in the utmost cloud. Okay, two other instances. Uh, th this is a puzzle, and by the way, Doing biblical philology, I, I found what was like a, a, a solving detective stories. It, it, it could be very exciting. 
in uh, the victory psalm uh, attributed to David at the end of Second Samuel, there's a puzzling word um, the, the, uh, that is uh, it, it, a line reads like this: "Your enut enutcha will make me many." So, what is enut? No, nobody seems to know. The, the JPS translates it um, as providence, uh, which makes no sense at all. Uh, and um, But what does that word mean? The word generally means to answer or to call out. And if you look at its occurrence elsewhere, um, when um, Moses comes down from the mountain and hears the sounds of revelry around the, the golden calf below. He says, I hear a, the sound of Enut. It is not the sound of Enut of victory and not the sound of Enut of um, uh, defeat, but it is an Enut. I don't know what it is. Okay. So, Enut means calling out. And if you look at the, the poetic context in 2 Samuel in, in which it appears, it appears in a catalog of weapons that God has given his heroic fighter. So I think that, that the, uh, the logical inference is that this is a weapon. What kind of weapon is a calling out? It's a battle cry that terrifies the enemy, uh, like uh, the the, uh, the sword of the Lord uh, and of David, uh, and uh, and so I translated this battle cry. Um, finally, uh, uh, an example uh, which makes me wince a little because it, it's not a matter of not figuring things out, but a matter of timidity on the part of the translators. In the story of Hagar in the wilderness with her young son Ishmael, um, you may recall uh, she the water runs out of the water skin and they're in the blazing sun uh, of the desert. And she's convinced the child will die within minutes. So she Vatashlichenu, that's the Hebrew verb, under one of the bushes. The, the, um, uh, the existing translation says something like she put him under one of the bushes. The JP says he, she left him under one of the bushes. Uh, the King James is a little bit better, but not, go, not sufficient. It says she thrust him under one of the bushes. But the verb hashlich has one meaning and only one meaning in the Bible, and that's to fling. It's the very verb that's used when Pharaoh says, "Every male boy you shall, every male child you shall fling into the Nile." So what's going on? The writer is a lot bolder than his translators. Uh, that is, he understands the psychology of this desperate woman. Convinced that her only child is about to die, she flings him down in a, a paroxysm of maternal grief and runs away. And you lose all that if you don't translate it as fling. Well, I could go on with, with uh, the, oh, uh, I'm going to give one more example of a mistaken translation. Uh, which, uh, if you get it right, it puts a new light on the story. You remember Samson has a wager with the 30 Philistine uh, uh, wedding guests that if um, they can solve his riddle, he will bring for each of them a, a, um, a, a roll of fine fabric and a change of garments. Uh, and the word for change of garments uh, is khalifat bigadim. And the, the important word is khalifa. When he finds out that, that they have 
uh, wheedle the uh, or coerce the, the solution to the riddle out of his wife in a rage. He goes down to the city of Ashkelon and he kills 30 Philistines and he takes their chalitzot, not chalifot with a pei, but chalitzot with a tzadi. So all the translators figure, well, uh, the wager was for garments, so this must be garments. So I, 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 I've seen it translated as tunic, as belt, even though I don't think they wore belts in, in uh, ancient Israel. And uh, the JPS translates it as a set of garments. But what could it mean? It occurs only one other place as something you wear in the whole Hebrew Bible. And that's in the civil war between the house of David and the house of Saul. Saul's general is being pursued by Asael, and he doesn't want to kill him because he knows that that, that, that will make bad blood between him and Asael's brothers. So he says, turn you to the right or the left and strike down one of the lads and take his chalitza. Now, what does a warrior take from a slain enemy in the battlefield. Everyone who's read Homer, and the Septuagint translators, of course, had read Homer and got it right, knows that, that um, it mean, it's the armor that he takes, not his garment, but something very, you, you remember um, uh, uh, Hector taking Patroclus' uh, armor in, in the Iliad. So, um, and that word, I think, properly relates to chalutz, which in biblical Hebrew means the vanguard fighters. So the chalitza was a special armor that was worn by these elite fighters in the vanguard. Okay, what does that do for the, the Samson story? It uh, throws an interesting uh, little light on it that wasn't there before. The wager was for garments, but uh, when the, the uh, enraged Samson goes down to Ashkelon, he says, I'm going to show these Philistines. He doesn't kill 30 uh, ordinary Philistines. He kills 30 warriors. And he brings back to the wedding guests something far more valuable than 30 sets of clothing. He brings back 30 sets of armor. And it's also a kind of veiled warning, warning to the Philistine wedding guests. You see what I did to your warriors in Ashkelon? I can easily do the same thing to me. So getting things right really makes the stories a, a, a lot more vivid and interesting. Okay, uh, I've spent a little more time on accuracy issues than, um, than I wanted to, but uh, let me go on to um, style. Uh, the, um, the style of the modern translations of the Bible, including the JPS, is wretched. It, it's wretched, I think, partly because the, these PhDs in biblical studies are out of touch with the literary culture of our age and have no sense of English style. So the, they have a, a tin ear for style and promiscuously mingled all kinds of different dictions and modern, modernisms that don't belong in a biblical story. Uh, and uh, uh, the language of um, uh, government Mandaranda and the, the daily newspaper and who knows what else. So it, it's important, uh, I think, well, it's more than important. Why do I make such a big deal out of style? It's not just that, that um, it makes the beauty of the original more evident, 
it makes the meaning of the original more concrete. Um, that is, you can't separate style from meaning. I'll give you an example that, that uh, relates to rhythm. Uh, as I was translating the, the first chapter of Genesis back in the 1990s, not really knowing what I was doing yet, um, I came to the, um, uh, the, the sentence which reports the creation of the heavenly luminaries. Now, the, the, the JPS uh, does something like this, uh, and he created the, um, the greater light for, uh, to dominate the day and, and the, um, uh, the lesser light to dominate the, the, the night and the stars. Now, to begin with, this is a perfect illustration of, of tin ear for style. Dominate is a verb that you would use in a sentence such as the Soviet Union after World War II dominated the smaller states of Eastern Europe. It is not what, what uh, the sun and the moon do to the day and the night. The way I translated it was this, and at first I didn't quite know what I was doing. Uh, and he created the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. So I stopped in my tracks and said, what does it do dominion? I said, well, first, because it's not really um, a, a, uh, an infinitive, the way everybody translated to rule, to govern, help heaven help us to dominate, but it's a verbal noun. So I wanted a verbal noun, uh, um, uh, dominion. But then I realized that there was a more compelling reason why I did it, and it had to do with the rhythm. That is, the Hebrew sounds like this, et ha'ma'or ha'gadol Again, in my version, the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. Now, I think your ear will tell you that I've pretty closely replicated the cadence of the Hebrew. Why is this important? You might say, well, it's just a kind of fussy thing that, that professors of literature care about, but nobody else cares about. But the rhythm means something. This is part of the priestly version of creation, the so-called P version. Now, the priestly writer has a grand sense of cosmic harmony of a, a kind of series of choreographed events effected by speech acts of God, in which we move from day one to day six, and then the first Sabbath. And subliminally, the cadence, that beautiful cadence, the cadence itself communicates subliminally to the audience this sense of harmony, this sense of beautiful things, everything in, in, in its uh, uh, ordained place. So, uh, now, let me make a few generalizations about biblical style, uh, and then uh, I will um, uh, uh, provide a few examples. The, the, there are three, in the prose, there are three levels of style detectable, and I've tried to um, respect each of those three. The narrative prose is a kind of, I would call it a middle diction. It's, it's homespun. It has a deliberately limited 
vocabulary. I could explain in the Q&A why I'm convinced it was deliberately limited. Uh, it uses um, ordinary Hebrew terms, primary uh, vocabulary, and it has um, a, a, what I would call kind of a dignity through its very simplicity. Then there is um, the dialogues, which are uh, by and large good literary Hebrew, but they make it make certain gestures toward the colloquial. And, and, and if I have time, I will give you one illustration uh, later on. And then there is uh, the, the language of poetry, which is elevated. I think that some of the vocabulary is a little bit archaic in its time. And that also has to be uh, respected. I'll, I'll give you one, one small example from the poetry. Um, uh, there's a one-line poem that introduces the uh, flood story, the flood proper. And uh, it, it, uh, in my translation, it's, it, it's like this, the, then the wellsprings, the, the deep split open and the uh, casements of the heaven open. Why casements? Uh, we've known for a long time that this unusual word, arubot, means windows. Uh, Rashi, I vividly remember from the first time I read this in Rashi as a student, uh, says, explains the, the uh, unusual term by saying, uh, fenestre belaas, that is fenestre, old French for fenetra woman in the foreign language. Um, but it's not the ordinary Hebrew word for window. The ordinary Hebrew word is chalon, which is the modern Hebrew word uh, as well. And it appears many dozens of times in the biblical corpus. Arubot has maybe eight or nine occurrences in the Bible, and all but one uh, are in poems. So it's poetic diction for various reasons. I think it, it also was a little archaic in its time. So I thought I can't just say windows. Um, I need something a, a little fancier and a, a little maybe removed in time. So I, I chose casements, which is a sort of word you can find in, in uh, Shakespeare, you can find it in, in Keats's odes uh, and so forth. That's, that seemed to me a way of honoring the poetic diction. But let, let me go back to, to the eloquent simplicity of the, um, the prose narrative. Um, I'm going to read a few lines from the prose, from the flood story. And the flood was 40 days, in my translation, and the flo flood was 40 days over the earth, and the waters multiplied and bore the ark upward, and it rose above the earth, and the waters surged and multiplied mightily over the earth, and the ark went on the surface of the water. Now, notice I said primary terms. The um, uh, the ark was on the surface of the water. Uh, the um, or again, um, the ark went on the surface uh, uh, of the water. Was and went. Now the the moderns all think the King James is better on this. The the moderns all think that, that that's too simple. So what they do is. Uh, what I would call tarting up of the, the biblical prose. And they, they, they say uh, the, um, uh, 
they don't say that the, the flood was, but the flood uh, overwhelmed, the flood surged, and so forth. Uh, and they don't so the, say the ark went, but the ark uh, floated, the ark sailed, and so forth, which is nothing like the Hebrew, uh, and uh, diminishes the, the eloquent simplicity of the Hebrew. And uh, that's all over the place. Uh, I, I will postpone uh, a, an example from a dialogue uh, till a, a, a little bit later. But, but let me say one thing more about the, um, the narrative prose. If you use a limited vocabulary, as the biblical writers clearly did, you may decide to make repetition of terms an artistic resource. And that is all over the place in the Bible. Uh, I, I I'm going to give you one small example where um, I believe my translation is the first to, to do this. In the Akedah story, we have, um, and Abraham said to his lads, that's my translation for uh, Na'arim, and Abraham said to his lads, let me and the lad go up and worship, and after we shall return to you. Now, it's the same word, Na'ar. Uh, nobody else has translated that way. They said, since, okay, Na'ar means a young boy or a young man sometimes. Uh, it also is anyone by extension who is in a position of subservience to someone else. So everybody translates it as servants. They could even be his slaves for all one knows. Um, but the same word is used in immediate sequence. Let me and the lad go up and worship. And I think that that, that is a wrenching, uh, a heart stopping uh, repetition. That is first the narrator re refers to Abraham's Na'arim his servants. And then Abraham speaking refers to his son as Na'ar, which is a term of affection. Uh, and to see that same word turned around in, in, in meaning gets some of the, the uh, emotional power of this very fraught moment. Um, okay, now, while I'm on uh, the um, uh, narrative prose, I have to say something about syntax. The, um, uh, the prevailing syntactic form in the prose is what is called parataxis. It's not a, 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 such a bewildering term. It means parallel syntax. In other words, you don't have clauses with uh, subordinate clauses attached to the main clause with, uh, uh, with conjunctions such as uh, uh, because in as much as uh, uh, since, though, despite, but you have and, and um, like uh, uh, these parallel independent clauses connected by and. Now, I think that, that well, oh, oh, I should say this, that all the modern translators think that you can't do that, that readers can no longer follow that kind of syntax. And so they repackage the syntax as though it were written in the 20th century. And I think that that is all wrong. Uh, first of all, uh, th there is a kind of uh, rhythmic power, since I, I touched on rhythm before, there's a rhythmic power to the 
parallel syntax uh, of the, the Hebrew. And then the fact that, that, that um, uh, you have independent statements uh, connected by an means that, that there is no causal specification. And you, as the listener to the tale, have to figure out your own um, uh, causal connection, which, uh, and there might be multiple possibilities. A tiny example. In the last confrontation between David and Michal, uh, the daughter of Saul, in, in which she uh, contemptuously derides him for exposing himself dancing before the ark. And he says uh, that, that he'll, he'll do what he wants, that, that uh, God ha has chosen him over her father's house to be prince over Israel. The story concludes as follows. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, did not have a child till her dying day. Not therefore, and or because of this, but and. So what is the connection? The, the, the connection could be that they stopped having sex after the, the, this mutual estrangement. It could be that, that that God punished her with barrenness for um, uh, vilifying the, king, the chosen king of Israel. It could be that, that um, it's a kind of random link. And the beauty of it is precisely in the end. But um, not to go on any, any longer about the, the prevailing um, uh, uh, um, a syntactic pattern of parallel clauses. I'd like to talk a little bit ab about deliberate distortions uh, of uh, syntax. So let me give one example. Um, when uh, Jacob's sons come back from their first journey to Egypt, they report to their old father that Simeon has been held hostage in Egypt and that the man who rules over all of Egypt, because they have no idea that it's their brother Joseph, uh, will not see their face again unless they bring down Benjamin with them. Now, the way this is uh, represented in my translation, which follows uh, the, uh, the Hebrew, this is dialogue is Jacob says to them, me you have bereaved, Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and Benjamin would you take? On me is all the burden. Alai hayu kulana. Now, uh, you may immediately say, well, we don't say in English, me you have bereaved. We say, you have bereaved me. Or if you want to uh, uh, emphasize it another way, you can say it is I, as some translations do, it is I whom who you have bereaved. But the Hebrew is unusual. The normal way in biblical Hebrew to say um, you have bereaved me is in a single word. You, you, you take the, the, um, uh, uh, the verb that means to bereave, uh, you uh, add to it to a conjugation, which means you have done the bereaving, uh, and a, a suffix, which means me, shikaltuni, one word. But the writer decided to do it differently. He broke out the pronoun oti, me, and stuck it at the beginning of the, of the speech. Oti shikaltem, 
me you have bereaved. Why do I think he did it? I think it's part of his characterization of uh, uh, Jacob as what I have called in print a prima donna of paternal grief. That's because he's grieving over Joseph, who in fact is not dead. Uh, so he puts himself at the beginning, them, me you have bereaved. Now, uh, in answer to the objection that it, that's a strange way to put it in English, um, if you go back, you know, maybe about a century and a half, a little bit more than that, in English writing, you find such syntactic inversion fairly common, especially in poetry. For example, uh, Keats's famous ode on first looking into Chapman's Homer is, much have I traveled in the realms of gold. Now that's not the normal way to say it in Hebrew, in English. The normal way to say I have traveled much in the realms of gold. But it was important for what Keats wanted to express to put the much at the beginning. Uh, and just as the Hebrew writer puts the OT, me, at the beginning. The fact that this sounds just a tad antiquated, I think helps what I want to do with style, because I don't want the English to sound as though it were written the day before yesterday. I want to give it a slightly antique coloration without making it um, affectedly uh, uh, archaic, you know, for suits and, uh, and and ends and so forth. So uh, I could go on with examples, but um, let me um, let me go on to um, the um, uh, to dialogue, which I, I haven't illustrated at all yet. Um, so uh, I'm going to take you back to the to Genesis 20. Um, and uh, you remember the story of um, Avimelech and Abraham. Uh, uh, Abraham has passed, has come to the uh, kingdom of Gerar uh, and passed off Sarah as my sister. And God came to Abimelech in a night dream and said to him, you are a dead man because of the woman you took, as she is another's wife, which is a startling piece of dialogue on the part of God. It's, uh, uh, I could have said, you're dead. I, maybe, I thought maybe that was a bit too abrupt. The, uh, abrupt. the, the, the Hebrew is in chameit, that is, uh, you are uh, a dead man, or you're about to be dead, um, uh, and this will certainly catch Abimelech's attention. And Abimelech had not come near her sexually, and he said, my lord, will you slay a nation even if innocent? Now that's weird, but the Hebrew is weird also. And I think that here uh, the, the words are distorted, not in the interest uh, of verisimilitude to, to speech, but alluding backward to the previous episode, the uh, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, where uh, God uh, was about to destroy an entire nation and uh, Abraham tried to bargain him down to 10 righteous people. So it's almost as if uh, there's a hint in, in what Abimelech says that, that um, uh, God, are you uh, up to your old tricks massacring whole nations? Didn't, and then he goes on to say, uh, 
Did not he say to me, she is my sister? And she, she too said, he is my brother. With a pure heart and with clean hands, I have done this. Now, the, uh, what I'd like to focus on for a moment, here we, we do get to the verisimilitude uh, of speech, is in she, she too said, he is my brother. The Hebrew sounds like, <clears throat> like this. For he, come he amra. Uh, th that is, it's a kind of stammer or a sputter of indignation. Uh, uh, you know, the, this couple here deceive me entirely, uh, and you get it in the way that the speech is articulated. And I, I would say there are many instances in the Bible uh, of um, somewhat distorted speech, which the, all the translators regularize, because if it was the Bible, everything has to be clear and, and correct. But sometimes things are not, because uh, the situation of the speaker is not clear and correct. A, 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 a striking example is when uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, the first messenger, uh, Achimatz, comes from the battlefield in Transjordan to report the victory over the rebel forces of Absalom. Um, he reports the victory, and David says to him, and Hashalom, Rav Shalom, is the kid okay? Is uh, the lad? Uh, Absalom, all right. At, at which point he starts babbling. Uh, and he says, I saw a great crowd and a little, little, little like that. Uh, and you can make no sense uh, of what he's saying. That's because he's afraid to tell David the, um, the truth that his son has been killed. And uh, all the translations I've looked at regularize this because the Bible should always be correct speech. Okay, let me go on a, a, a little bit with um, Genesis 20. Uh, and Abimelech rose early in the morning and called to all his servants, and he spoke these things in their hearing, and the men were terribly afraid. And Abimelech called to Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us, and how have I offended you that you should bring upon me and my kingdom so great an offense? Things that should not be done you have done to me. And, Abraham, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you imagine when you did this thing? Now, I'd like to point out a, a formal feature of biblical dialogue. You all probably know that there's one set way to introduce speech. And uh, Reuben said to Simeon, Simeon, and then you have Reuben's speech. And Simeon answered and said. But it also happens quite a few times that uh, that pattern is diverged from in the following way. And Reuben said to Simeon, and then we have Reuben's speech, and then again, the introduction of direct uh, discourse. And Reuben said to Simeon, in all those instances, and I, I don't know, I've collect, collected 30 or so, the, um, uh, the indication is that the interlocutor has a problem responding. He's either embarrassed or, or shocked or dismayed, or just utterly surprised. And that's, I think, what's indicated here. And finally, after the second speech by Abimelech, what did you imagine when you did this thing? Abraham has collected himself. And he says, for I thought there's surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. And in point of fact, she is my sister, my father's daughter, though not my mother's daughter, and she became my wife. And it happened when the gods made me a wanderer from my father's house that I told her, this is the kindness you can do for me and everybody. 
to which we come, save me, he is my brother. Now, uh, first I suspect, although I'm not sure, that this beginning with, with um, in point of fact, omna in the Hebrew, is a, a legalism. That, that is, he's kind of cutting, splitting hairs and setting up a little verbal um, smoke screen about the exact uh, relationship of Sarah to him. But what seems to me uh, more piquant is uh, when the gods made me a wanderer. Now, as far as I know, I'm the first translator of the Bible to translate this as the gods with a small g. Every translator renders it as God made me a translator, made me, oh yeah, God, God made, made me a wanderer. But the Hebrew Elohim, which many of you may know, has a masculine plural ending, but uh, is um, construed as a singular, I mean, is the general name for God. In a few places, a very few places, it's treated grammatically as a plural, which it is here. Vayihi ka'asher hitu oti Elohim. Those who know Hebrew know that hitu is a plural verbal form. So what's going on? It's again this wonderful verisimilitude of speech in the dialogue. That is, Abraham is speaking to a polytheist. He doesn't want to confuse him. So he says, when the gods made me a wanderer, you know, the way you would say the gods made me this or that, and it's almost a, a, a kind of automatic uh, turn of speech in the sense of my fate, destiny, circumstances, the gods made me a wanderer. And I, I think it, it's a wonderful little turn in the dialogue. I, I remember I, I, I sort of treasure this moment. I gave a, a version of this in, in Australia in, in um, Melbourne many years ago. And, and a young Chabadnik came up to me after he said, this couldn't be. Uh, Avraham Avinu would never say the, the gods, and I couldn't convince him, of course. Okay, I, I think I'm pretty close to the 50-minute mark, so I'm going to uh, uh, regretfully renounce all the other examples with which I could regale you. But I want to say just one thing about translating poetry. That biblical poetry is extremely compact. It, it has a lot to do with the structure of biblical Hebrew, which has uh, very few uh, polysyllabic terms, and also um, uh, combines words, as we saw in Shikaltuni, so you can say in one word in Hebrew what you say in three or four words in English. And uh, it's a big challenge in the poetry to get the powerful compactness of the Hebrew into English. And what I sought to do, sometimes successfully, not always, was to tamp down the English language. First of all, to get rid of um, polysyllabic words, uh, not iniquity, but crime, and so on and so forth. And also to get rid of all unnecessary terms. So I, I will conclude with one example of the tamping down of the English for poetic effect. Psalm 30 uh, is uh, basically a Thanksgiving psalm uh, spoken by someone who was on the verge of death, evidently in grave illness, and was uh, healed by God. So uh, in the middle of the psalm, he uh, recalls the desperate prayer he uttered to God to save him. And uh, there's a half line of, of 
uh, well, I'll read the, uh, I'll recite the whole line. Uh, 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 there's a line of poetry that goes like this in the Hebrew, Ma betza biddami beridity el shachat. And the King James Version, followed by the moderns, actually says, What profit is there in my death, in my blood, in my going down to the pit? Uh, I, this bothered me because it was arrhythmic, especially the first half of the line. What profit is there in my uh, blood? You can hear that, that it's arrhythmic. And then it dawned on me that two words, which are italicized in the King James Version because they're only implied, not explicitly stated in the Hebrew, is there or not necessary. If you drop them, you get what profit in my blood, which is exactly rhythmically like ma betza bidami. So that tiny maneuver made me very happy. And it's the kind of thing that uh, I try to do throughout my translation of the poetry. Okay, all translations are imperfect, especially translations of great works. And you make compromises, sometimes painful compromises, sometimes slightly embarrassing compromises. But the idea is to try to get closer to the subtlety, the power, and the eloquence of the original. Uh, and the, the Hebrew is all of those. And that, to the best, best of my ability, is what I did in translating the Bible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Alter, for sharing with us uh, this evening. Uh, there are a number of, of questions uh, that, that I'll ask on behalf of our, our participants. Um, if you have a question, you can feel free to write it in the, the Q&A. Uh, the first, you had mentioned earlier about the simplicity of biblical, biblical narrative in certain situations. The questioner wants to know, was that a specific choice? And was it because uh, the Bible was read out loud to people who may not have been as sophisticated. There's a way to easy, more easily understand the text. Hmm. That, that's a, an interesting proposition. And it may be true. Um, but what I, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe the writers just felt that, that the simplicity worked, that, that it was eloquent. But let me um, explain why I feel that it was a deliberate choice, this limitation of vocabulary. Biblical prose has a much smaller po uh, vocabulary than biblical poetry. The, uh, well, uh, I'll give you one illustration. In the prose, there is only one way to say light which is, that is the kind of light that comes from this, the sun or from an electric bulb or a candle, which is or. And uh, the cognate is ma or, which is the source of light. Um, if you look at the um, poems, you see maybe five or six different words that, that mean light, that would be the equivalent in English of effulgence, brilliance, radiance, uh, luminosity, et cetera. So you know that those words were there in the language, but the writers decided not to use them. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, uh, one of our participants noticed uh, in many of your modern translations uh, and your translations, unlike other modern translators, uh, you haven't necessarily purged your translations of the uh, sometimes problematic vav as and. Uh, and uh, they agree that some of the ands ought to be there, but you have a policy or set approach on which quote unquote ands remain. Well, uh, I... I think I addressed this in uh, in my lecture that 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 I think that that the ends are, are, are both rhythmically important 
in all sorts of ways, those parallel clauses linked by and, and also open up possibilities of multiple explanations of what's going on. Now, okay, I, I will share with, with you a personal anecdote. The, uh, uh, the teacher who first got me excited uh, about the Bible when I was 17 years old uh, and a junior counselor at Camp Ramah was Moshe Greenberg, who was a really fine Bible scholar and a wonderful teacher. So Moshe and I remain friends. And uh, when my uh, Bible translation came out, I, of course, sent him a copy. And he wrote me back, this is before email, uh, trying to be diplomatic, but he clearly hated my translation. And uh, he said, why did you use so many ugly words? I didn't understand that. I didn't think I was using ugly words. And he said, and you can't translate Vav as An because English does not tolerate it the way Hebrew does. So my rejoinder was the following. Uh, I said, for a long time, it's been a, a, an important resource in literary English to use this kind of syntax with parallel clauses connected by Anne. Of course, Hemingway does it, influenced by the King James Bible. And uh, for my money, the, the, the greatest piece of extended prose poetry written in English in the 20th century is Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of James Joyce's Ulysses. And there it's and, and, and parataxis to wrap. Thank you. Um, a question about your specific translation, a couple. Uh, how in your translation do you handle the change of Ishmael's designation and status from Yeled to Nar uh, when the angel tells uh, Hagar to, to uh, you know, leave that child or not leave that child behind? Um, as I recall, um, let's see, d d d does it switch to Na'ar then? I, I don't remember uh, specifically. Okay, uh, 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 my, my memory uh, stumbled for, for a moment. Um, well, I, I think that, that the, the Yelad suggests his... Um, uh, his youth, that he's just a child. Even though there's one place uh, in the Solomon story where Yeladim is used as young men. So these terms slide around a little bit. And uh, uh, if he's then called Na'ar, it's because um, he now has a future. Thank you. Um, another question about uh, your translation, actually, from what we read uh, this past Shabbat from Parshat Bahar, that you make note of your translation of Dror as release rather than as liberty, as the King James uh, version puts it. Uh, comparing that to Nechama Leibovitch's uh, translation, uh, which really um, uses evidence of this rare and Torah word and compares it to the synonym Chofesh, uh, her suggestion is that Dror is a deeper form of Chofesh, a sort of the Yovel is a utopian ideal. And a questioner wants to know if by your translation of Dror as release, uh, do you suggest that, um, that, that the Yovel was something less than or something different than a utopian ideal? Yeah, I don't think it's a utopian ideal. Th that is, Nechama uh, Leibovitch, who uh, wrote many perceptive things about the Bible, was not really a, a, a philologically grounded Bible scholar. So as a speaker of modern Hebrew, you know, Dror meant freedom, uh, and Chofesh meant freedom, and Cherut meant freedom. And then she tried to draw the distinctions. But here, th this is not my innovation that, that is, uh, Many decades ago, Bible scholars found cognates uh, of um, draw in, in Mesopotamian law. Uh, and it's a legal term 
that means uh, release from obligations. So I, I, I follow that. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment from one of our, our questioners about um, the use of gender, referring to God still as he uh, and the Lord, uh, gender specific translation, uh, given words like Elohim and Adonai, uh, referring to God are ungendered plurals without specifically referring to male or female. Are there other translations that could be more inclusive? In my, I've been asked this question before, and my, my resounding answer is no. The, the, that is, um, both Elohim and Adonai, re remember that verbs are gendered as well as nouns in Hebrew. And they are always gendered male. So it, it's wrong to say that, that, uh, that, that they're non-gendered. And um, I would also add that, that in the more anthropomorphic representations of God, which occur in Genesis, um, he looks like a man. That is when three strangers appear uh, in front of Abraham's tent in Genesis 18, one of them is God and two are um, divine messengers, his celestial sidekicks, so to speak. Um, he sees them as three men, not three um, uh, uh, non-binary creatures, but, but three men, and he uh, greets them that way. So my, my strong conviction is that we should not reshape the Bible in translation to conform to our own values or our own ideology. So as much it may, as it may uh, stick in the throat uh, of contemporary fem feminists to translate God as he, that's the way he is in the Bible. Following up on that about um, not, not to translate in the Bible based on our own, you know, more modern ideology or theology, um, a couple of questions. One specifically, are your translation choices at all influenced by documentary hypothesis? Um, and then furthermore, I would add, uh, how do we find that balance between looking at Torah as literature to, to study versus seeing it as a holy scripture that is meant to guide us spiritually uh, and how can our translations impact us spiritually rather than simply as an academic exercise? Well, my conviction is that by honoring the uh, literary shaping of the biblical language, you also get closer to uh, the, um, uh, the biblical sense of spirituality, which is not quite like our sense of, uh, of spirituality. For example, the book of Psalms, which I have not mentioned in almost an hour of talking, um, is we all think of uh, as the, the major locus uh, of spirituality in, in the Bible. But it is, if you look at the Hebrew, a spirituality anchored in the Bible. And uh, I'll um, give one example. In one of the Psalms, I think it's somewhere in the 60s, um, uh, the, all the translations say, my soul thirsts for you, O God, in a parched land without water. Now, first of all, I never use the word soul because there is no biblical concept of soul. Nefesh means life, breath, life. And by extension, it means among us, several different meanings, but by extension, it, it sometimes means throat or neck, because uh, the throat is the passageway of, of the breath, right? It's what literary scholars call metonymy. Things are linked because they're, they're in contact with each other. 
So I looked at the context of, of that line in a parched land without water. And I thought, he's not talking about soul. He's talking about the throat. My throat thirsts for you, O oh Lord, like uh, uh, in a parched land without water. Uh, and that's a little shocking. It's not as beautiful as my soul search for you, but, but it, it, I think, authentically expresses the sense uh, of the uh, physical grounding of spirituality in the Bible. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions about other translations. Uh, some of our questioners want to know uh, what you think of the Everett Fox translation, and also want to know what uh, uh, the scholars who translated uh, the JPS translation think of uh, your new translations. Oh, well, uh, the, I admire uh, Ed, 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 Everett Fox's boldness. I mean, what he wants to do following uh, the, the model of uh, Bubert Rosenzweig's German translation of scripture is to get across the Hebrewness of the, the Hebrew in his English version. The, the problem is that, that there are too many places for, for my taste in which he, in order to do this, he comes up with, with um, translations that are not really English. For example, at least in his first version, uh, Mizbeach, altar, he translates as slaughter site, because the, uh, the root of Mizbeach, Zavach, means to slaughter. However, I, I'm not sure that, that uh, the ancient Hebrews thought of slaughter every time they saw Mizbeach, because th this Mizbeach and the Choshet, the, the, uh, the copper altar, which is uh, for incense, there's no slaughter at all conducted uh, on it. Um, so I, I think it gives you a, a little bit of a jolt when you, you come across slaughter site. Or again, for the sake of, of rhythm, uh, he says, thou shalt not adulter, but that's not really not English. I think you're stuck with, with commit adultery, as clunky uh, as it is. So, uh, as I said, I, I admire his courage, but it's, uh, and it, it's a helpful Bible for study, but I, I don't think it, it conveys uh, adequately, uh, the sense of texts that, that are pitch perfect in the idiomatic, idiomatic language use of their own time. Um, now, I, I have, well, the, the only direct response of one of the JPS translators I, I, I have had is the one I mentioned by Moshe Greenberg. And by now, I think none of those translators are around. So, so not, none of them saw to be outraged by my 3,000 page uh, version. Thank you. One last question, uh, and then I wanted to turn it over to Rabbi Deborah Weinstein to share some words with us. Uh, but last question for you, Dr. Alter. Um, you began your discussion this evening talking about beauty and the beauty of Torah, the beauty of, of biblical texts, uh, and at times that's linked or contra contrasted with accuracy. And wondering if you could speak more about that balance. And I guess a, a clarifying question of that um, whether or not uh, your translation or any translation is really commentary. Uh, and if we look at translation as commentary, how do we assure accuracy uh, if we're translated to any language other than Hebrew itself? Okay, all translations are commentary. You cannot escape that. Th that is, you, uh, you have to make uh, certain decisions, let's say for a word that, that means 
different things in different contexts, like nefesh. So you have to make a decision in the specific context. Uh, what is it? What's the salient meaning? Uh, and then you, you make your, your choice. So uh, none of us can escape the bias of our own assumptions, our own historical and cultural uh, uh, locations. So uh, I, I, it would be arrogant for me to think that, that, I, that I had, uh, uh, in fact, eluded the, this, uh, this bias entirely. W what I have done is to make a good faith effort to be honest to what I, I think the Hebrew was meant to say in its original context. And my example of a few minutes ago of nefesh meaning throat would be one instance. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple other questions, but I apologize that, that we are, are just about out of time and don't have opportunity to get to all of them. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Alter, for, for sharing uh, truly your Torah with us uh, this evening. I want to turn it over to uh, one of my teachers, Rabbi Deborah Orenstein. Thank you so much. It's very kind. And I really appreciate tonight's lecture so much. I know my dad would have appreciated it. He loved looking at the Bible uh, with intensity. He loved looking into the detail and the poetry of the language and the etymologies and the philology. And he also just loved a brilliant lecture. So I know he would have been just delighted by tonight's teaching. I was thinking how to honor my father and also at the same time honor our guest, uh, Dr. Robert Alter. And I decided that I'm going to read the translation of the 112th Psalm from his edition uh, of the translation that he recently put out in full and that has been really the culmination of a lifetime of work. And this is a psalm uh, that is used in some ways ritually in parallel to the much more familiar Ashat Chayel, just like we say, uh, the proverb for a good woman uh, at Friday nights and sometimes at a graveside in memoriam. It's traditional also, but lesser practiced to recite the psalm for a good man. Psalm 112, and it's an acrostic that in 10 lines, uh, doubling up and then tripling up toward the end, gives us the A to Z of what it is uh, to be a good man. And it begins, Haliyash Reish. Um, and so it begins with happiness, actually. Happy is the man. And I always think of my dad as someone who knew how to enjoy life, listening to Dr. Alter tonight. You know, he loves what he does and he's in love with uh, biblical poetry and narrative. So I think beginning with um, the idea that we praise God for the joy of good people is a good place to begin. And uh, I'm going to read the translation and then end uh, with the second to last line in the Hebrew, because it's often repeated uh, at the very end, and you'll see why. Hallelujah. Happy the man who fears the Lord. His commands he keenly desires. A great figure in the land his seed shall be. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Abundance and wealth in his home and his righteousness stands forever. Light dawns in darkness for the upright, gracious and merciful and just. Good is the man who shows grace and lends. He sustains his words with justice. For he shall never stumble in eternal remembrance the just man shall be. From evil rumor, he shall not fear. His heart is firm. He trusts in the Lord. His heart is staunch. 
he shall not fear till he sees the defeat of his foes. He disperses, he gives to the needy, his righteousness stands forever. His horn shall be raised in glory. The wicked man sees and is vexed. He gnashes his teeth and he quails. The desire of the wicked shall perish. And then we return because uh, it's the custom not to end on this sad note of watching those gnashings of teeth of the evil who are vexed by the eternal triumph of good. We return to the good. Pizer natan la evyonim, tzidkato omedet la'at, karno tarum gachavod. Pizer, which Robert Alter translates as he disperses, is such a beautiful word. Um, dispersing as in dispensing tzedakah and giving of the self generously. Uh, my father was someone who... <laughs> dispersed himself widely. He was comfortable in so many different situations with such different kinds of company. He was remarkably generous with his time, with his humor, with his money. In every possible way, he dispersed and dispensed goodness in Torah. Sidkato omedet lad, the word sedaka, as I'm sure Dr. Alter would attest, doesn't just have one meaning. It doesn't just mean the giving of money, but it also means victory in biblical Hebrew, and it means righteousness, uh, and it means as well justice. So his righteousness, his victories, all the good that he built up at Bethel uh, stand forever. And tonight we have lifted up his horn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah, for those beautiful words. Um, it's profound that we learn in Rabbi Ornstein's memory uh, as this week on the 25th of ER, uh, we observe his yard site. And in learning, uh, we make sure his memory remains bound up in the bond of our lives. Uh, when we say the El Malay Rachamim, the memorial prayer, uh, we uh, uh, promise to give to causes uh, that are meaningful to them so that our loved ones live on within us. Uh, I want to encourage everybody, uh, if you want, in uh, Rabbi Ornstein's memory, to uh, give to the Rabbi Yechiel Ornstein Memorial Lecture Fund. Uh, you can do so by uh, going to the Bethel website and clicking on Donate. And then when you click on making a donation, you scroll down and choose the type for the Yechiel Lorenzian Memorial Lecture Fund. Uh, may we continue to learn Torah together uh, and may we continue to do so in Rabbi Ornstein's memory and honor and may his memory be for a blessing. Amen. Good night, everyone. Amen.